for Parkinson's disease, obviously. This is not going to replace, uh, by the way, can I start? I'm starting already. <laughs> you are ready to go. I I'm think go. usually we start maybe like in three or four minutes because there are some people who, uh, you know, with any group, there's early birds and then there's uh, um, just by the, the skin of their teeth. Late, a little bit late birds, late joiners. Yeah, I know, so all kind of birds. I realize that. Yeah, um, all kinds of birds. <laughs> Eagles and sparrows and yeah. all kinds of birds. But I, I, I like can start yeah. by um, uh, maybe introducing and um, kind of get things going while we wait for maybe some stragglers to join mm -hmm. in. Yeah. So. I will have, uh, so other than, um, other than you, Dr. Pajweem, I've placed everyone in auto mute so that during this opening portion, you know, we're, we don't have people cutting in and interrupting you. Um, and then when we get to the live Q&A portion, we will um, um, take questions from the audience. And there's a couple ways people can chime in with questions. They can either type it in the chat um, and you can either type it to the entire group or if it's something private, you can just do a private chat with either me or the, the PMD Alliance account. Um, and then uh, Dr. Pudweem, I'll kind of be your, um, you know, your, uh, your traffic cop to pick questions and, and make sure that we, um, you know, we, we stay moving. And we know that, you know, you can't, you know, without uh, an exam and, you know, these people aren't your patients, but any kind of, you know, like broad overview answer or however you want to, um, you know, frame your answer, people, just so everyone understands, obviously. Um, there's only so much uh, detail that you know you can get into when you're answering someone's question at, in an online meeting like this. Um, and then let's see, I think that would be it when it comes to the housekeeping items and you know rules of the road. So I'll start by introducing. Um, this is lunch with jocks for May 2019. Um, my name is Andrea Merriam. I'm with PMD Alliance, and we are the group that facilitates and organizes these online programs. Um, we're dedicated to bringing the world, um, you know, quality information about movement disorders straight from the, uh, the experts. And today, the expert that we have with us is Dr. Farzan Pidweem. Um, so he is based in Southern California at Loma Linda University. And um, I will let you add any additional, you know, credentials or important intros that you want to add to that, Dr. Pudweem. But um, yeah, but I'll, I'll just turn it over to you and, and you have your slides up here. And maybe um, when it's uh, do you want me to signal you when we kind of get to the, the time, give you like maybe like a five minutes when we get to the time for questions or you, you're all set? That's fine. How long do you want me to make the talk? Uh, usually the beginning, the overview, um, you know, we do maybe like 20, 25 minutes or so. And then we have the, everyone can ask their, you know, their burning questions and start to digest the topic and, you know, apply it to their own lives and then, and do that by asking you questions. Sure. No, that's fine. I currently work at Loma Linda University. I'm one of the uh, associates there. And uh, I also have private practices in LA and Huntington Beach. Uh, so um, I do run a few trials over there with my colleagues at the far end of the dashboard in Parkinson's. The talk I'm going to give today is pretty much on non-medical therapies on Parkinson's disease, particularly music and Parkinson's disease, which kind of um, piqued my interest uh, when I was in college and later on in medical school, which actually motivated me to enter this. I was originally a concert piano player. I have a lot of background in music, and I always wanted to combine music and medicine, so that's why I ended up um, uh, kind of picking neurology and picking Parkinson's disease eventually despite a few bumps on the road. And I never regretted it because there's always something 
interesting about the brain and music to be found or read about or discovered. I will highlight some of the points that uh, I think are fun and most, in, most importantly kind of uh, significant in Parkinson's disease that will help you guys with motor abilities without increasing medication. And in some patients these work and some other people doesn't work, but I will mention this throughout the talk. This is one of those things that regardless of, um, regardless of whether it works or not, in incorporating music in your life is always a positive, pleasurable thing. Uh, so you can try it and see if it helps your mobility. If not, then hey, it's, at least you enjoyed a few, few musical pieces which uh, brought you some pleasure. Parkinson's disease, and we'll start from the basics and I'll spend a couple minutes on this. Parkinson's disease is associated with loss of dopaminergic cells in the uh, basal ganglia. Okay, the basal ganglia is this inner part, if my mouse, I find it's this inner deeper part of the brain that includes these green blue nuclei. These are areas of significance which we call nucleus. Nucleus is basically a bunch of cells together. So um, this is usually a dysfunction in this area. And the Parkinson's disease is usually associated with depletion of dopamine producing cells. And this depletion causes problems at many levels. The most obvious one that haunts patients is the tremor and the motor dysfunction. So motor, tremor, slowness, stiffness. You don't have to have tremor to have Parkinson's, by the way. You can be stiff and slow. So motor impairments are the pre predominant ones. And then you also have mainly gait and posture instability as well as some cognitive psychiatric uh, problems, um, as well as speech. The role of music in Parkinson's is mainly hidden in the beat and rhythm perception and, uh, that patients have, because it's been discovered that Parkinson's disease actually destroys our perception of rhythm and music, uh, mainly rhythm. And this is uh, very important in our perception of speech as well as movement, because everything in life, including our hearts, our lungs, our breath, our movement, has an innate rhythm in it. So when the rhythm gets destroyed, uh, the speech becomes impaired, and walking becomes impaired, even uh, balance and other things become impaired. So an internal sense of rhythm goes away, and it is beneficial for us to have an external sense of rhythm, okay? And I will get to that in the next Next slide. Rhythm is very complicated. You don't have to have any melody or anything to produce a rhythm. But just to go over the basics of the music, music is basically sound and silence. That's what combines, it, what do those two things combines to make music, okay? Now you have other aspects of things, which is pitch, dynamic, timbre, rhythm, all of that stuff. But the main thing we're gonna focus on is rhythm, which is a tempo and a meter, meaning how rapidly you tap. Like for example, I can demonstrate this, usually I demonstrate it in, in, in an open crowd. Okay, so rhythm is how quickly you tap and how often does a tap get emphasis. So for example, I go over the waltz. Waltz, everybody know, knows waltz. Boom, bum, bum, boom, bum, bum, boom, bum, bum, boom, bum, bum. Now this can be as fast as you want to make it to be or it can be very slow, boom, bum, bum. But the main important about rhythm too is that in a waltz, it's three hits, one, two, three. The only difference is the first one gets emphasized, this other two does not, okay? So that's what creates a waltz. So it's a rhythm and that the rhythm is threes. The rhythm is always off and on, off and on, off and on. But, but what creates the waltz is the meter that every third gets an emphasis. The tempo is basically how fast it is. Okay, so rhythm is a combination of tempo and meter. Uh, the tempo is how fast you tap. The meter is how often you give a beat uh, emphasis. Now, this is just a basic overview. I'm sorry, I'm cramming a whole bunch. Uh, the rhythm in itself is a recurring pattern. Okay, weak and strong pulses makes a beat. Okay, this is just getting a bit technical. All you need to know is basically is that the rhythm and the beat is what's significant, okay? So the beat means that you have to have some kind of a pulsation, that's the beat. The rhythm tells you how often you get emphasized. And this is some of the things that I'm interested in because not every rhythm is good. 
Okay, the walls is not good for Parkinson's because it's three. All of our lives, all of us, all of our metabolism is typically is a cut time or two over two rhythm, which is one emphasize, one relax. Even heart is two beat, thump, 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 thump. Walking, you have two legs. And usually the dominant right leg is more emphasized than the undominant one. So it's thumb, 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 thumb. Remember, you have a beat or pulse, which is the thumbs, but then you have the recurring pattern, which is the meter, which every other one gets emphasized. So that's your meter, basically. Um, the rhythm is composed of, again, this is going over the same thing that I spoke about, the tempo, how fast it is, and how number of the beat in a second, or which beat gets emphasized. It's, it's good to know that rhythm or beat, rhythm is how fast a beat is. But the most important thing is the meter. The meter tells you how often does something get emphasized. And the key point is uh, the cut time, two over two or three over four. Three over four is a waltz. So every three beats gets emphasized. Two over two is a march, okay? And I have samples of this. This is a waltz, or for this will work. Let's see. Oh no, it's not working. It's opening something else, which I don't want it to open. Okay. Let me see. see. I hate Apple people. This is the dark side. I don't care what anybody says. I've never been able to be successful. I got an apple because of peer pressure. It looked sexy. Everybody wanted it. I said, eh, I'm going to have one. Big mistake. Uh -oh. maybe, that, maybe that means that you have to sing to us. Oh, God, no. I can play for no. you. I would love to sing. No. Okay. My wife runs when I sing. Hold on. It's actually working. I should have been nicer to it. Oh, there it goes. It's just taking a so sec. You see okay. It? We'll be patient. Y yes. You see it? Yeah. So this is an example of the waltz. If you live in the Riverside Not this, area, this is the advertisement. And you are tired of settling with your career. See? One, two, three. 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 I want you to hear the beat at the bottom of it. One, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, so, and then the one that I think works best for Parkinson's is so, so remember again, tempo is how fast it is and how many beats you have in a minute, basically, how fast it is. And meter determines which beat gets emphasis. How often do you get emphasized on a beat? So basically, this waltz is every three beats. It gets emphasized. Tum, 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 tum. But this one, two, two, what's this? This is, I'm sure you guys are, all have heard this. In the class, everybody gets excited and answers these better than even I know. I attempted to learn waltz once. So this is one, two, one, two, one, two. So this is basically a march. So march, in my opinion, is the best for Parkinson's and Parkinsonian symptoms because it's a cut time. So it's two. It's every other beat gets emphasized and it's two beats per measure, if you know a little bit of music. And most of our daily function even our physiological function has a rhythm, has a beat, and it's usually a cut time. Heart has two sounds, thump, 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 thump. Walking has two sounds, but one right, left, right, left. Usually right is more prominent because people, people are right-handed. They're left-handed, the left foot is a little bit more stronger and more predominant. So that being said, we're gonna go to the next one. Now there's other stuff with the beat that I'm not gonna get into, but the most basic music and the most like ancient music, it's actually drumming that has to do with beat. So there is no, uh, there is no reason why we shouldn't think that drumming or beat has an effect on our physiology. 
because even the most ancient or more basic music, such as African drumming, is also a pattern of beats which has been integrated into consciousness. And there are many cultures that use beats to actually um, go beyond the human function and enter trance states, which I usually discuss this more in depth, which are very interesting. But I have a few, uh, basically, uh, slides that I'm going to get into. And the beat and the brain is actually, by the way, I should have made this the, I should have made this the uh, title of my talk. Now I'm thinking about a beat and the brain. I, I thought of this last night, but the beat and the brain is actually, is very, very integrated because even the neuronal functioning, the pattern of functioning, if you listen to the neurons, neurons firing in the basal, basal, ganglia, basal ganglia, they actually have rhythms associated with them. So this is very commonly seen and it's heard actually in the OR when we implant EDF. So um, the benefits of all of this stuff is uh, basically in basal ganglia disorders such as Parkinson's disease, which there is reduced perception in time. Are you guys still here with me? Hello? We're still here with you. Is still it still here with me? Okay, sorry, I lost you guys on the screen, that's what. So um, in the basal ganglia, that has to do with all time perceptions, okay? And there is reduced in time perception. There is no wonder why this whole emphasizing beat and listening to patterns of music and exercising with music makes an, makes an impact because in, when the basal ganglia gets bad in Parkinson's patients, there is reduced in time perception. There is difficulty learning motor tasks, especially timing tasks. They actually did the study, timing study in UCLA when I was doing some research over there. I showed that Parkinson's patients have a delay in understanding and internalizing external rhythms and beat. Okay, so it also, there's a dysfunction in the way they speak, not necessarily because they can't speak, but the rhythms are off. Because basal ganglia integrates and coordinates and like smooth out all the functions of basically the rhythm in the body. And the gait also, the walking is also off, not only because of gait dysfunctions, but also because the rhythm of the walking is off. So there is no question that exercise, especially exercise with, with music is gonna be very beneficial. And you already know all the medications, some of the dopamine agonists, the Meropex, Carby, Dopa, these are all the physical medical stuff, but music, I think, because of it presenting an external source that the body and the brain has to match in order to reinforce the beat and the rhythm that's lost plays a big role, okay? Now, music therapy is like very much like a student learning a piece of music. It has to do with listening and repeating, okay? And this listening and repeating actually creates not only plasticity in the basal ganglia, meaning more nerve cells to be generated, and more connection between nerve cells, but also it's, uh, it enhances the rhythm that is lost, which we don't know exactly how the rhythm is produced in the basal ganglia, but they call the basal ganglia the metronome of the brain because it produces and keeps rhythms in a lot of the daily function. So you listen to the rhythm on the outside and try to do it. It's kind of like the big therapy or the physical therapy that everybody does. You get better eventually, just like a musician who practices a piece for a long time they improve eventually. So the main form of this is called rhythm auditory cueing. So you hear something and you do it. There is also musically cued gait training, okay? And then there are other forms of finger exercises, which I'm not gonna get into, that rhythm fine movement training with, with music, which actually was very exciting during the 80s and the 90s, there was a professor who was doing it. And if you ever come to a live talk, I'll go over it. And then the music therapy, also helps with reaction time because patients with Parkinson's disease, they're delayed in reacting to stimuli on the outside and they cannot keep the same pace as external tasks. Like for example, if somebody walks next to you, not only they have problems with stiffness, but also they can't match the rhythm of the person walking next to them because their rhythm perception is off. So by walking and doing physical therapy with music, pretty much you get more benefit. And um, music therapy and speech too, it also plays a big role because it helps with articulation. 
if you exercise or sing with music, there are other areas of the brain that are activated that you usually are not activated. So it helps produce more clear and more organized speech. And it also helps do the rhythmic vocalization. This is basically a new technique that they repeat something with music and then you repeat it back with music without hearing it again. But the music is there as a background. So basically conversational phrases are embedded in melodic phrases to support speech. So one of the examples this lady is demonstrating, I just want you to see a few seconds of this. And all my clips are from YouTube, so there's no mystery about anything. If it works, it's very good. Here we go. This is an example of it. New videos every day. Hello, I'm Hope Young, and I am the owner and founder of the Center for Music Therapy in Austin, Texas. And today's video, we're going to talk about speech and breath um, so and music. And again, uh, something that we do very successfully. This is where I, as a music therapist, will play. Dr. Pajween, the video went away and we can't see it. Oh, you can't. I don't know yeah. why you can't, you can't see it. Can you screen share again? Yeah, I'm having screen share. Can you hear it? Yes. Okay, so just hear what she does. That's it. Okay. About and have you fill in the blank. So you might say what something like this. I say, you say, you say, and I say. So basically what they do, they put a melody associated with regular speech that you want to use during the day. And you basically, uh, while playing a rhythm or melody, they work on the phrases of speech that you have difficulty with. So they say it to you with music, and then they play the music, and they expect you to do it. And patients tend to do better because music serves as a cue for them to be able to articulate things that they couldn't articulate before. And the reason we, they get, we get improvement, we really don't know why. But music does play a significant role. And the benefits of music and the music therapy, this is extensive. I mean. When you guys come, and I, sometimes I have a little bit more talk, I get into the, con, con, uh, into the conversation of music and trance. And music and trance in Sufis is some really amazing things. I mean, I studied this at uh, UCLA for a while, and they do really amazing things. I, I've read some articles about it. They can totally control their physiological function. More importantly, um, their autonomic functions, which we technically or theoretically don't have any control over, such as bleeding. When you cut your hand, you're not going to say, oh, I'm not going to bleed. No, I can't bleed right now. No, no, I, there are no napkins around. I can't bleed. No, you're not going to do that. You're going to start bleeding and you have to run to the bathroom or find napkins. These Sufis and mystics, which are sometimes in northern part of Iran um, and the Middle East, um, they've done some really interesting stuff. I don't have the videos. The video belongs to one of my friends who was studying ethno with me at UCLA. Unfortunately, I have to go to the library and see if I can get permission to use that video. But they literally, when they go in this true rhythm, and you see this with Neville Dervishes who swirl and with rhythm, just pure rhythm, no melody, they enter in like states of trance and they control their blood pressure bleeding and they don't feel pain and i've seen some of these videos done with kurds in the northern part of tehran and iran and it was it's freaky it's freaky my uncle who was actually a violinist who visited some of these parts 40 50 years ago was always always talking about this and to this day he's still talking about it because they do really weird stuff and they don't feel pain so, and they're, they're trained since they're young, so I, I don't think I can do it or you can do it, but it shows that with practice, anything is possible, and music can serve a beneficial role. There's a whole bunch of data on this. There was positive evidence to support that the use of music-based movement therapy on treatment of motor function, and the, but there is neutral evidence to support music, music therapy on cognitive function. So basically, there is positive evidence that music therapy helps motor, but not with the cognition. But personally, I don't agree with that. Uh, yes, we're scientifically it may not, but whenever you listen to a piece of music, you feel happy. 
unless you listen to a sad piece of music, then you feel sad. But still, there is some pleasure to be taken out of the music. So listen to what makes you happy, and I promise you, you get some positive results. But then I'm a scientist, so I have to give you scientific facts. And there are some evidence of the music for treatment of cognitive function, and this is evidence in some people with dementia, because some people with dementia can't follow, can't sing, can't do anything. But the second you start singing old tunes to them, they start singing it from heart because they were tunes that they were raised with. Okay, and sometimes in some stroke patients, actually, through music and rhythm, listening to music, they can sing and they can move, but they wouldn't be able to move otherwise. So music and the way music is kind of intertwined in our brain and integrated in our brain, it's still a mystery and there's a lot more to be discovered. Um, but it's very exciting stuff. So just to summarize, there's expected results with this. You improve communication skills if you integrate music and speech therapy. You increase confidence in communication. You enhance expression. You improve muscle control and nerve control if you do exercise with music, especially heavy rhythm that kind of reinforces your movements one, two, as you walk because not only you have internal sense of stimuli that I need to move, you also have an external one that allows you to move. And there are actually devices that get attached to your thigh or you wear them and they vibrate when you freeze. They notice you. When you freeze, they start vibrating in a rhythm and they break the freezing. And a lot of the times I tell my Parkinson's patients, start tapping your chest when you freeze and then you can start walking. So there's a whole bunch of stuff I'm interested in but thanks to the little chipmunks I have at home and wife and kids, um, it's, I've been slow in pursuing some of these research stuff, but there's interesting stuff in Parkinson's and rhythm therapy and all that stuff. But I encourage you guys to always seek musical therapists and Parkinson's therapists and the speech therapists who incorporate music in your physical therapy and routine, because I guarantee you, you're gonna feel better and you're gonna get more improvement if you do the same exercises without music, okay? And if you're around from here, this is my little Melinda address. I work at Long Beach and I have private practice. I'm in Newport Beach. If anytime you wanna have any questions, that's my contact information on top. And I guess we now can open to questions. Again, did I mention I don't like Apple computers or Mac? <laughs> uh, what, maybe once. <laughs> maybe once, yeah. But we, uh, okay, so now we can see you. And okay, so hold yeah. on. Oops. Now Let's we can see, see you. And oh, here we go. Yeah. Uh, close this. And now, oh, here we go. We all can see each other now. Yes. If anybody has questions, I will gladly answer questions. Okay. So um, Laura in Florida, I believe, said that she has a video of the whirling Sufi dervishes that she took yeah. in Istanbul, um, and she's offering to share. Oh my God, please send that to me, because I, uh, my uncle lost the footage from 40, 50 years ago. The footage I had was from 20, 30 years ago, was taken by my colleague who was very protective of it. Ah, if you are willing to give me a copy, oh my God, you would bless me very much. How, can, can I give her my email? Uh, yeah. Let me give her my email. F as in Frank, A as in Apple, R as in Robert, Z as in Zebra, 3000 at gmail.com. That's my personal email. You guys are more than welcome to email me. Anything. Okay. So we can share that with yes, uh, please do, Yeah, please do. Yeah. Laura. Uh, yeah. I, I want to see that. Uh, I want to see that video too. Maybe as a follow up, we can. Yeah, um, I, I didn't go into the depth of that, but uh, some of these pictures is difficult to be viewed. Um, but uh, let me do a screen share. Uh, oops, I can't do a screen share in the whole last second. What happened? Oh, exit full screen. Let me see if I can show you something that I wanted to show you. Uh, And right so now, in this, case, in this case, if you look at this girl, if I'm oh, we, can't, in, we can't see your screen right now. We can't see the screen anymore. So no. during, during the Sufi uh, mystic trance state, she's actually punctured her tongue with a sharp, long pin. It's not bleeding, and she's totally okay with it. 
I, I shave and I just a couple couples cuts and my face bleeds for hours. Not only that, I'm crying like a baby. So, I mean, these are like real stuff. And this is not, see, you, you look at their faces. Sometimes people pretend they're not in pain. You see them kind of meh, trying to hold it up. But this lady was totally, totally. totally that. So good that. Oh, hey, we have someone else here. How are you? Hey. Hi there. I think that was uh, that was an accident. Unless, did you want to ask a question? No, anyone? Okay, anyone? it was no. an accident. But no. it was nice to see your face. Um, we have another question about, so the device that you mentioned that when you freeze, um, it starts to vibrate. Do you, do you have the, someone wants to know the name and where they can purchase it? So this was, this was a research and a device used in a Korean study. It's okay. not something that's available in the U.S. yet, okay? But there are a couple companies that are working on it. If you Google it, you might be able to find somebody that uses it. But you don't have to go that far. If you have an iPhone, you can download a metronome app, okay? And the metronome app, some apps have vibration components to it, okay? Or if you wear an Apple iWatch or something like that, you can create different apps. There are different apps that are metronome apps that can beat. But sometimes, um, sometimes, yeah, the problem is that it's not going to know when you freeze. It's going to just be ping all the time. So what you can do when you freeze, usually your leg freezes, your arm doesn't freeze. So you can start tapping yourself on a chest or tapping yourself on the leg, and uh, this will enable you to walk. This is a cheaper version of the device, but you yourself tapping yourself. I haven't seen any company that produces this in the US that I can recommend, but if you do find one that you like, um, please let me know so I can tell other patients because last talk to somebody asked me about this and I, I don't have a device yet. But uh, iPhones do vibrate, iWatches do vibrate. So if you download a metronome app, then you can basically tap your watch, activate the metronome when you freeze. And then while this is vibrating on your wrist, then you can help yourself break free. That is something that I've had a couple of my patients try, but you have to be a bit uh, technologically savvy regarding doing that. Yeah, so I hope that helped. Yeah. Okay, I think a lot of times people hear about, you know, these, these newfangled devices and it, you know, maybe there's some promise in, or, you know, some hope in if I had that new gadget and gizmo, but I love that your tip just to do, you know, you could do that yourself or have, you know, someone who's with you start doing that, you know, that yeah. tapping. And I bet it's a lot cheaper than that, you know, it fancy. It is a device. lot cheaper too. The same thing I tell people who are trying with the dominant Parkinson's, you can either invest a hundred or 150 in Google spoon, or you can basically get two silver spoons, heavy old school silver spoon. These are the one you find in antique sales shops, okay? Those two, okay, wrap them with tape, make a thick handle, okay, and grab it like this and eat it. It will work the same as the Google spoon. But obviously people like new technology, so I recommend them trying Google spoon, or now there are like two or three different competitors making these gyroscopic spoons that when your hand shakes, the, the bevel shakes, but the spoon itself remain it, like immobile, so you can eat very easily. So if you have tremor predominant Parkinson's disease, you can get this gadget that's running around on the internet called the Google spoon or the competitor. It's called a gyroscopic spoon. Or you can take a silver spoon, use duct tape, make a huge handle and grab it like this, and you will have the same benefit or efficacy and reduces your tremor when you're eating, in case that's something bothers you. Any, any more questions? And then you can use that $100 to go buy a, uh, you know, a concert ticket or something and enjoy concert it. Yeah, exactly. I love it. I love it. And next time I'm going to use that. Okay. Uh, someone had a question that there's a lot of news stories about music and learning a musical instrument and playing a musical instrument, delaying the onset of dementia and Alzheimer's. Is that true for Parkinson's related dementia as well? 
So Parkinson's related dementia is a different form of dementia. It's a Lewy body. It has to do with the same aggregates that are causing Parkinson's disease. People who develop dementia usually have these aggregates in different parts of the brain and at, at a different concentration, but that's again controversial. What I want to tell you is that we don't have specific data yet. We don't have great results yet, but yes, it will help. Why? I'll tell you something. Especially if you have to use your finger, you already have, if you have Parkinson's disease, you know you will have problems with fine finger movement. So picking up instruments like guitar or piano, which you have to force yourself to do fine finger movement, is going to create more synaptic neuron plasticity, meaning you're going to force the neurons that are left to function more. So hence, they're going to create more contacts and more uh, like relations with each other. So it strengthens abilities and motor function. If you want the common sense answer, yes. Because as musicians too, there have been some studies that show musicians that make better surgeons because they have better fine motor skills. Um, but um, it, it, there's nothing specific on Parkinson's and picking up an instrument. But again, when you, when you use something, you create more neurons, you create more connections among neurons. So the reasonable answer is yes. So actually I recommend to all my patients to pick up an instrument, either a guitar or a piano. I like piano because it's less complicated and if you tremble, it's not gonna be very difficult. Uh, but if you don't have too much tremor, even if you enjoy guitar, I recommend picking up a guitar because you're using both of your hands. The strumming and the fingering is best, is best. You can pick any instrument you like. Harp is good too, don't get me wrong. Uh, but some instruments use only one, like woodwinds usually typically use one hand, unless it's like a clarinet. And tuba is not that complicated. So I recommend something a little bit more complicated, like a piano. Violin is a horrible idea, because it's, it's a very difficult instrument. I had struggled with it, okay? And the bowing, if you're a tremor, it's not going to serve any purpose. You want fine finger movement. So yes, yes, do it. Okay. It's fantastic. So a couple people chimed in. Michael in Tucson says he does taiko drumming. I don't know what that is. I think that's the Japanese drumming with the big sticks. I'm not that familiar. Oh, big sticks. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, and then Shelly says accordion. Oh, accordion is good too. I, I, I played around with accordion. Then I realized I'm getting too nerdy, so I stopped it. I said, that's one instrument I can't do because then I'll get too nerdy. It's not good enough. So, but yeah, I've, I've kind of played most of these instruments. Um, accordion is good too, excellent, because you do the fingering and you're playing the keyboard at the same time. So you, you play the, the fingers and it's, it's, it's an excellent, I think it's an excellent idea too, because you're holding it and squeezing it instead of the piano. When you put your hand on the piano, if you have tremor, it's gonna get worse. But when you hold the accordion, you're actually no longer in a resting phase, you're in an action phase. So Parkinsonian tremor tends to subside when you're in the action phase. So accordion, actually, I'm assuming it might get better results for some patients who are tremor predominant Parkinson's disease. Uh, and the drumming is actually great because in the VA Long Beach, uh, there is a group or Afro-Cuban drummers and a lot of my patients are doing the drumming. And if you do it for a prolonged period of time, this is not for fine finger movement anymore. This is for actual movement, which is amazing because you're now taking that rhythm and internalizing it, which not only helps with the physical movement, but actually with the movement uh, of your body and mind at the same time. So great, excellent. There's Afro-Cuban, there's a Navajo version of cube, uh, like drumming. Uh, there are many variants. There are many variants, any, any kind of spot. I like both hands to be used at the same time, if that's a possibility. Anything else? Yes. Um, so this is, what about karaoke? Totally different than, you know, I, I like it. I like it. Because most people, it's psychological too. Parkinson's doesn't affect only motor. It affects mood, cognition, and a lot of other things, sleep, and uh, basically affect all of this stuff too. So by doing karaoke, not only... You're coming out of your shell. You're always embarrassed to talk. Some of my hypophonic patients who can't speak, the speech is not clear. They're very upset and they're ashamed to be talking outside. 
But when you're in the karaoke setting, even I start singing, which is really scary, by the way. So, um, so it's fantastic. You see what I'm saying? So um, it, 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 it serves many different levels. It gets your mood happy. It, it helps your, you vocalize it. You're not, no longer afraid. Some of these speech therapies and loud therapies, they actually say that imagine there's a little smurf in the corner of the room and you're yelling uh, to make the smurf understand what you're saying. Because a lot of the time, again, remember I told you the basal ganglia has to do with perception. You don't know, the brain doesn't know that you're speaking soft. It thinks that you're speaking loud. Just like the brain doesn't know that it's no longer able to keep rhythm, it thinks it is, but it's no longer is. So by doing things that is exaggerated, like big therapy that is marching, or loud therapy that is exaggerated, you're kind of resetting the lost inner rhythm or the lost inner baseline that was destroyed. So yes, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a, there's a lot to pick through. Okay. I'll yeah. go. Is well, there a... You can go quickly. Yeah, I can answer. Okay. I was going to say, um, is there an optimum beats per minute speed that promotes easier movement? So I don't know if that means for, you know, listening. Yeah, I, I know what they're saying. Okay. Technically, they say studies 60, 60 to 70, because our heart rate usually is 70. And that's a rhythm we are born to. So yes, that is something that, that has come up before. And I've looked into it, the research of it. Yeah. Okay. Is so... If you were to search, you know, just do a Google search, 60, 70 beats per minute. I mean, because yeah. to me, I don't know whether that's a slow song or a fast um, song. It's, um, it, you can look, Google it and listen to okay. it. That's usually an average, average rhythm. It's not too slow. It's not too fast. Okay. Too slow, but you can try it. I would say between 60 to 80. Okay. With all the stress of medicine, I think my heart rate is now 95 usually. So. Uh, it depends what your heart rate is. It's kind of not true. 60 or 70 should be fine. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's what they say. 60 is the magic number a lot of the articles refer to. But again, everybody's different. Just like everybody's Parkinson's is different. When patients come to me, I say, your every Parkinson patient is different. So obviously, everybody will respond to maybe a different rhythm and it may be a different tempo. Anyway, that's all. Next, next question. I, I loved what you said that pick what to you know creates joy in you you know if you yeah, 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 yeah i love that um okay so shelly wants to know if you have any specific advice for activities or warm-ups for parkinson's choirs no but i have a friend who does i have to talk about her and next time you catch me ask me hopefully i'll have an answer for you okay uh, and let's see. Okay, so Angela said that she loves African marimba and yeah. she, there's classes all over the Pacific Northwest, Boulder, Santa Fe, all lovely places to visit. Maybe a marimba, you know, tour is in my yeah. future. It sounds lovely. Um, let's see. Desai says he sings regularly at the senior club. Way to go. And okay, so here's another one from Laura. She's thinking of using symbols to show her doctor how she's managing short staccato movements by audio. You know how when they ask you to tap your thumb and- Yeah, a lot of my, couple of my patients bought the finger symbols, the belly dancing symbols. They are yeah. actually very good because you hear it as you tap it. So it reinforces it. Yes, I recommend it. Some couple of my patients, after they heard this, they, they got the symbols and they really loved it. So yes, I like it. I like it. Okay. Good idea. You have to do some online shopping for uh, belly dancing symbols, little belly. ones. I was picturing belly. those big ones like you had with the penguin and the polar bear, but the little oh, ones. Oh, yeah, the penguin and the polar bear. Yeah, those are good, but I don't think how many of those uh, like symbols you can handle hearing after a while. I can't handle too many. But the little tiny symbols I think are better and you can exercise your fingers. I have some, I have some videos on finger exercises, which are, I will show maybe at another time. They're beneficial. Uh, and then you can go like this and do this, tap, 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 tap. And this one also, you have to do it with the rhythm and with music, which is fun. Anyway, 
Okay. And for you as a physician, can you benefit from here instead of visually seeing the fingers move? Does it help you to have that auditory measure of the symptoms? Of course, of course. The auditory measure is, is beneficial for all of us. Okay. When my kids stress me out, I listen to music. So obviously I get some pleasure and relief out of that. Okay. So yeah, obviously hearing it is better than just seeing it. So you're using many senses to do one task. And that's one of the way you can uh, form more solid, everlasting memory. So that's positive. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, someone, this is kind of a personal question. They were wondering when you, what age did you start studying the piano? And um, I guess they were just curious about your other yeah. side as a concert. Yeah. Piano. I started at five and I kept it until right before medical school. Um, so, but now I've been lazy. I, I, I have one, but I, I don't like that. Or the, it's an electric keyboard and I need to buy a piano for my kind of place right now. But there's a lot going on. So yeah, within the next few months, I'm going to buy it. Yeah. But ever since age five. Yes. Okay. Wow. And are there any music um, research studies going on that any of our Southern California people could participate in right now? So the answer is no. And that's partly my fault because I don't have anything going on right now. There were one or two studies, um, uh, I don't think they're there anymore. Um, UCLA had this timing study a few years back, which I was part of. They don't have it anymore. It ended. Uh, the better answer is I'm not aware of right now. Okay, but once I go to the meetings this year, then I may be able to find out more. If there is something and you guys are interested, please email me. I'll email come of my friends. But you have to understand the problem with music is it doesn't generate revenue. It's not like a drug. So it's very difficult to get funded for. You have to find a very nice guy who does it. Uh, and uh, it's very difficult to get uh, funding for it. So it's become a little bit more scarce. Uh, in the 90s and 2000, there were quite a bit. At UC Irvine, where I trained, there was one of the attendings who was doing it too. But And UCLA too, in early 2000, there were two people who were conducting it. Right now, I'm not aware of anything. But it doesn't mean it's not there. I need to look a little bit heavier into it too. Okay, I will let you guys know. If you're interested, email me. I'll look into it. I'll get back to you guys. Okay. Um, John says that he had DBS about a year ago, and he thinks his perception is that it has affected his internal rhythm. And he wondered if... He, you know anything about that and if maybe that's it just does. Oh, it does i hear that and it also affects the speech but there is nothing to do when that thing is on the magnetic force and the conduction it creates it's so strong i think you get benefits from listening or doing stuff with music but that supersedes everything it, it's not to discourage you john i mean you try the music and see if you regain something but the second you turn that off, your speech and everything becomes normal. So some people turn it off part of the day, turn it back on. You can speak with your doctor. There's, you have a gadget. You can turn it on and off as you please. Try that and see. There are different settings they can try to. Okay, sometimes those settings are better. I don't know who is programming. Okay, but ask them. Tell them your problems. They, they will help you. They will help you. Okay, so discuss that with your doctor. It might be something that can be addressed in the, the program. Yeah, sometimes in the program, it can be that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Steve Hurst says, Dr. Padweem is the best. Oh, I know Steve Hurst, yes. I know Steve. You have your, your personal fan club. I know the fan club is out there. Good. It's, you know, I don't have a Facebook. I, right now, now I know why people get a high from Facebook. You have people reading you, paying attention to you. You're now popular all of a sudden. So yeah, so it's, everybody is forcing me to open a Facebook. I, I'll have to open one. Yeah, so now I feel the joy that people feel. Yeah, so anyway, sorry, I took you on a tangent. What does he want? What is he asking? No, that was it. He oh, just that was it. Okay. Yes, yeah. thank you, Steve. Yay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, let's see. There looks like there's a lot of treble clefs. 
require um, fans? Why, why am I referring all my patients in Newport Beach to the treble class people? Okay, and I have a bunch of their cards and I always pass them out. The problem is I, I think they're in Laguna Niguel or Laguna Beach and some people can't drive there. And I'm now moving to Huntington Beach, which has me scared. But I have, I recommend travel class to everyone. This is amazing, people. I recommend it, I recommend it, I recommend it. There's nothing to lose. You have some fun and you exercise without, because you're exercising with a group, you're singing with a group, so nobody's fixated on you. So you can speak loud, you can make mistakes. That's the best thing. That's the best thing. I recommend it. Anyone, any other questions? Very good. Let's see. Um, someone wanted to know that they've heard that playing um, marching music, like the one that you played for us, yes. um, while taking a walk is yes, good for the brain. Very helpful. Multiple research has shown that, yes. Okay, but why, why is that? So it has to do maybe because our body functions on a cut time, because our, our walking is one, two, one, two, and marching is cut time. Dun, 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 So it has, I think it reinforces our innate rhythm that we're born with. Heart rate is two, your breathing is kind of two, big breath, short breath, big breath, short breath. Heart is bum, 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 and walking is one, two, one, two. So the inner rhythm of us, I think, is cut time. It's two over two, yeah. Okay. So that's what right, yeah. But the answer, is obviously, uh, this is plausible. This is what we think, but there's no direct or definite answer. Sorry, next question. Okay. Um, regarding your comment on how, since there's no money to be made from music research, um, this person says there's also no real money to be made from exercise research because uh, there's no product necessarily that's, to sell. That's not true. That's not true. Because that's not true. That's not true. Because we as Parkinson specialists pushed, uh, we're pushing insurance companies to give you guys not only 17 sessions of physical therapy, but actually more sessions. So finally last year, Medicare approved that Parkinson's patients can get continued physical therapy as long as they show improvement. So the research regarding exercise is different because there's physical therapy, so gonna benefit from it, from the data that comes out and things like that. Music is not like a medication or like a service that is gonna bring financial gain. So that's why, that's why I was saying that sometimes it's very difficult to get supported. If you look at the NIH grant website, there's so many researches that are supported by NIH, but unfortunately the funding is low because nothing comes out of it that can be sold later to patients. You see what I'm saying? So this funding is so low that it's very difficult to hire people to get a trial up. Most people come and they volunteer just like they were in some of the studies that I participated when I was younger. Okay, that's what I meant. Not necessarily everything has to be financial. I'm just illustrating slightly the financial aspects of it. Okay, yeah. but there's still stuff is happening. It still is quite a bit of stuff is happening. It's just that I don't know about it uh, around me, but there's other stuff happening, especially on the East Coast. I hope that answers this question. Yeah, I and I guess he was also leading to, you know, what can we do? And I think this might be beyond your purview as a movement disorder specialist, and it kind of goes to, I don't know, uh, lobbying or politicians and awareness, but. Um, how to get more money into Parkinson's research was the question. Yeah, it's, it, it is, I don't know. I don't have the answer. But I will tell you sometimes necessarily more money doesn't mean the right thing. I think quality researchers are key because like a few years ago, ALS got a lot of funding, over $100 million because of the bucket challenge. But it has to do with, with the quality of the researches. But I think Parkinson's is progressing much faster than a lot of other neurodegenerative diseases. So whatever they're doing so far, I think has gotten off pretty decent results. But yes, to answer your question is, I don't know. I leave it up to people above me to determine that. But good researches are more valuable than money, I think. That's, I that's love that. That's yeah. a great 
That's a great perspective, especially coming from someone in your shoes, you know, who's been um, in the research world and yeah. been a part of uh, clinical research. Thank you, yeah. Yeah, let's see. I want to make sure I get all the comments. So lots of people shared in the, in the chat comments the particular choirs that they're a part of. Um, Steven recommended um, harmonica. I think you'd probably, I think I know your answer, Dr. Pudwin. You'd probably say if you like it, it's a good idea. If you like it, it's a great idea. Okay. Yeah, but would I like harmonica? Yeah, well, yes, it's great, but maybe for controlling breath techniques, but for fine finger movement, I prefer other instruments that are more active in both hands. But yeah, okay. do whatever you like. Yeah. So you have to get that, that one, like Eric Clapton, where it connects, and then you yeah, also yeah, play the guitar. I'm also playing it, yeah. So, yeah, yeah you, you should do the harmonica at the same time you're playing the guitar or the piano. Then I will okay. love you. Yeah. You got that, Stephen. That sounds, that sounds like a lot, but. Um, or the Mary Poppins movie, the original Mary Poppins, he comes out playing the drum with his foot and then playing the harmonica. That scene is always amazing. He's a talented guy. Anyway, for tangents though. Yes. Next, next Whenever next you're time. dual tasking, multitasking, that's, that's good for anyone's brain. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Yeah, I think that covers all of the questions that I see in the chat. And um, Greg wanted to know if the talk is being recorded. It was recorded and we will put it on our YouTube channel. Give us a couple days or so because um, I think people might want to share this maybe with other members of their um, of their choirs or their support groups or, you know, people in the community. Um, but I think that uh, wraps up, unless you have any final closing words, Dr. Padweem? Play an instrument, listen to music, and okay. enjoy it. That's all. That's Love all. Love it. In a nutshell, that is easy advice. We can all go home and take. You don't need research sometimes. Do the common sense thing. Sometimes it's good. As long as there's no harm, there's going to be some good. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank so, you guys for inviting me. It's always fun. Yeah. I, always on you guys. I have a fan now. <laughs> I saw 30, it was 38, went down to 35. Um, at the logging off, yeah. Yeah, people started logging off. Um, at the height, I think it was um, over 50. So, ooh, ooh, and then we never know about our anonymous, uh, anonymous our anonymous people. logins. So. Over 50 followers. Ooh, exciting. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time. Thank you so oh, much. Thank, thank you, me. everyone, and thank you, Dr. Pudweem. You're always a uh, always a fun guest, and just love you know your your approach and your personality. So we'll thank have to God. do it again sometime soon. We'll do it sometime soon again, and I have some new stuff for you guys. Okay. Okay. Cool. Bye, you guys. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye.